My next guest was among a handful of leaders calling the shots in the bailout of the U.S. economy, a role that was captured in the HBO film Too Big to Fail. The problem is the toxic assets. Let's just buy them. Ooh, call it cash for trash. When the market stabilizes, we'll unload them. Hopefully, Treasury will get its money back. Is that in the Break the Glass plan? Basically. Neil Kashkari, who actually looks like the guy who portrayed him, was the mastermind behind the trouble. He actually looks a little bit like a thinner, more handsome version of me. He was the mastermind behind the Troubled <laughs> Asset Relief Program, or TARP, the $700 billion program that kept the U.S. banking system afloat. Now he's the head of global equities at PIMCO. Neil, good to see you. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, was that an accurate um, depiction of what was going on, that you guys were, were together uh, with the Treasury Secretary, sometimes with Timothy Geithner, sometimes with the the Fed chairman and you were all looking at this and saying we, we got to try something new we've got to try something new we've got to be decisive we've got to be big about it absolutely Ali we were we would much rather have failed trying many different things than failed not trying and it was unprecedented times we had to try as many things as possible because what was at stake as you said in the lead-up what was at stake is the entire US economy you're seeing a lot of policy experimentation still going on at the Fed and obviously still going on in Europe today. All right, but th there's this fine line between policy experimentation and trying different things and sending a message to the global economy that you're on top of this, that you can do something that's really going to make a difference, that you're going to perform surgery rather than put another Band-Aid on one of those thousand cuts. Europe's got this feeling of, of death by a thousand cuts. You're absolutely right, and it comes down to spreading losses. So go back to 2008. Our financial system had taken on too much debt. They had too much losses. They couldn't afford it. We, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve and the Congress, had to go in and take those losses from the banks and spread it out over the American taxpayers. It wasn't fair, but it was necessary. In Europe, it's a similar situation. Some countries, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, have taken on more debt than they can afford, and it needs to be spread out over the rest of Europe. But that's a real political challenge. How do you get the Germans to step up and say, yes, we want to pay off the Greeks' debt. That's very hard. We were able to do it in America because, as you said, we had one central government that could act on behalf of the whole country. They don't have that in Europe. Knowing everything you know and having been through everything you've been through, what should Europe do now? And the reason I ask that is because China is slowing down, because the U.S. is slowing down. We all need Europe to solve this problem. You're absolutely right. Unfortunately, it's taken two years to get this far. It is likely to take many more years to ultimately resolve the Eurozone, because they're trying to do two things at the same time. Provide basic stability for the Eurozone and keep pressure on each of these governments to make painful choices. If they came in very aggressively and put out the fire once and for all, as we did with the TARP, all the pressure would be off Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain to make tough choices. And that's why the Germans and others don't want to do that. So they're left taking these bandages one at a time, barely providing stability but keeping pressure on, and that makes the crisis go on for many years, unfortunately. Neil, you've had to explain this probably to a million people, some of whom don't understand, maybe some who are kids who say, what is it you did? Explain to me, it's all about liquidity, right? It's all about taking money from somewhere, and at this point, this tends to be public money or tax money, and, and providing it through a system so that it can ultimately funnel its way through to businesses, people who will borrow it, use that credit, buy things, and create demand. Why is this so complicated? Isn't providing liquidity the same everywhere you go? It is. It's very complicated because we have a very sophisticated global financial system where, you know, you and I and your viewers save money. They put it in the banks to earn a rate of return. The banks then turn around and make loans with that. What ended up happening in our country is the banks made a bunch of bad loans. They took on too much debt. They took on too much risk. And then all of a sudden the whole system was freezing up and about to collapse. And so the taxpayers had to step in to stabilize the banks to say, we will support you because you play a very important role in our economy. In Europe, you're having a similar situation with European banks, but you also have a situation where individual European countries have taken on too much debt and the countries need a bailout, not just the banks. So it's an even more complicated problem in Europe today. A year before TARP, which was in the fall of 2008, 
the American economy was firing on all cylinders. The Dow was at 14,000. It was an all-time high. Home prices were still good. Uh, unemployment was under 5%. Uh, we, had a, we had some bullets in the chamber in the United States. Now you're looking at these European countries with unemployment in some cases, like Spain and Greece, over 20%. Youth unemployment, over 50%. Uh, can that problem be fixed in the same way? They've got, they've got other problems. They've got people saying, forget bailing out the banks. Where's my money? Why don't you give me the money? No, you're absolutely right. Again, the politics are very hard. We actually think our analysis here at PIMCO is that Europe has enough money across the Eurozone to deal with this problem. The question is an issue of fairness. How do you get the countries and the citizens of those countries that have been more responsible to bail out those countries that have been less responsible? And it's a distributional issue rather than a total dollars issue. So let me take you back then to 2008 when you were coming up with ideas and TARP or whatever you called it when you first put it together looked like a, an idea that might work. And of course, uh, Henry Paulson, then the Treasury Secretary, uh, takes it to Congress and gets a flat out no. In a democracy, it's much easier to clean up a mess after it happens than it is to reach consensus to prevent something bad from happening. And so we felt that we had to go to Congress. We had to ask for their help, but we weren't sure if they were going to get it. And so when the House voted it down the first time, it was a real blow to us, but we knew we had to keep trying because we knew what was at stake. But it was also a prevention at that point because at that point, or that was acting on something because when the House voted it down, that was the day most Americans and the world will remember is the day that the Dow dropped 777 points. So Congress was saying, we're not taking all this debt to bail out fat cat big banks. Uh, and then the American public said, or investors at least said, wait a second, you've got to do that. So then a few days later, Congress finally passes it because they realized we were now in a complete financial meltdown. You're exactly right, Ali. That's the day when most Americans, regular Americans on Main Street who saw their savings in their 401ks get hammered. They said, wait a second, it's not just Wall Street. This is going to affect me personally. And that's ultimately when the votes in Congress came around. And so if you look to Europe, many observers are waiting for that kind of moment when the men and women on the street of Germany and other countries say, you know, we are at stake here. Our livelihoods are at stake. And then they turn around and tell their political leaders, you need to act. You need to stabilize this crisis. That hasn't happened yet. And that's why we've seen these Band-Aids over the last couple of years. What is the precipitating thing going to be that causes them to say that? I mean, well, you've already got such terrible situations in some European streets. Well, that's what's so frightening is can you have a precipitous event that's not so calamitous that it brings down the whole Eurozone? Right. So you need a minor uh, precipitous event in effect. We think Greece is going to exit the Eurozone, notwithstanding their vote earlier this week. We think they will exit. We don't know exactly when. We don't know whether it'll be a, a stable exit or an unstable exit. And we don't know which other countries may go out the door with Greece. That could be a precipitous event. But there's the risk that it turns into a calamitous event. And that's what scares us. All right. And, and you, you are of the view that a, a real breakup of the euro would be a bad thing for the world? It'd be a very bad thing. It would bring down very likely plunge the global economy into recession and the American economy with it. So we hope that that does not happen.